format will be, I'm going to kind of um, talk to you guys about what AMPA does, Association of Nigerian Physicians in, in America. Um, my name is Dr. Stanley Okora, I'm the current national treasurer. I live in Atlanta. The, the topic for tonight is obviously the COVID-19 is creating havoc for everyone, physicians and uh, non-physicians alike. But um, a lot of our, our uh, members are experiencing financial difficulties. So we thought to uh, use this opportunity to bring up some people to help us navigate this rough, rough time. Um, AMPA is a 501c organization incorporated in uh, 1995. We, we represent the interests of 4,000 plus physicians, dentists, and allied health professionals uh, that are of Nigerian birth and uh, ethnicity. Um, because of our, of our members are experiencing financial hardship during this period, we, we brought together some people, financial people, um, there will be a lot of uh, um, crossover on their discussions to help us uh, uh, um, navigate what's going on in the world right now. Um, just to put a little plug in for AMPA, um, these are some of the members benefit because this um, webinar will be, uh, is, is being recorded and um, it will be uh, shared throughout the, um, uh, the AMPA sites. But we, we do uh, provide professional development such as this. We have a lot of leadership opportunity, uh, uh, practice um, re referral, networking, and we also have uh, support for each other in terms of need and in terms of joy. And one of the biggest things uh, that we do is we do a lot of medical mission and volunteerism. And I, I like Dr. Onike, I met him millions of years ago in a medical mission and so many other people, Dr. Klipeke and all that stuff. So that's what, that's what AMPA stands for. And uh, if you're not part of AMPA, you're missing a lot. <laughs> so, and if you want to join us, our website is very robust at ampa.org. You can pay your dues online, and we are very, a very well professional organization. We are 26 years old this year, right? 26, right? Yeah. All right. So, tonight, these are the things that we're going to be di discussing. I have about I have five professionals who are going to talk about surviving financial hardship during and after the pandemic avoiding practice and personal financial problems, how to deal with your employees, that's the biggest one, and how to manage your personal and practice loans during this pan pandemic. We also have a psychiatrist who's going to talk about the, uh, uh, the psychological impact of this because we don't want anybody to go into depression, worse physician suicide is big. So we need to talk about that, personal issues. We also have a lawyer, um, from uh, that will talk about the legal aspect of it, and if time permits, um, many of us, including myself, may have who, who can share our experiences, experiences and learn from each other. So that is the uh, plan of tonight. Sonia, are you ready to go? Sonia Balfour, Piers, okay, Jerry. I'm gonna, are you having trouble uh, logging in? You can unmute yourself. If uh, there's a mute button, you can unmute yourself. Go to the lower left of your screen, lower left. While we're waiting to, them to come can uh, Dr. Our national president, Dr. M Emily Fed just sent me a text. She's she's uh, not able to join us for due to patient care issues. Uh, uh, our president elect is on the line. Chris, can you say a word for us, please? Thank you, Stanley, for you know putting this together. Uh, I think uh, members of AMPA, we're all very, very appreciative. Uh, it shows part of the 
things you benefit from being a member of AMPA, and I think we will all benefit from this opportunity to hear from the experts um, as we navigate this new world of COVID-19. So once again, I thank everybody who have created time to attend this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. So I'm okay, Stanley. There's a mute button. Um, so you're, you can see us, you can see the slides, right? Okay, there's, I don't know, are you are you're on your computer, correct? Okay, um, I'm gonna pull your slides up and, um, okay. I, I'm, not, I'm listening to you on, on my phone, so <sighs> technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have to find a way to unmute yourself. Uh, okay, just uh, okay. Join audio. There's a mute button. I don't know what kind of computer you're using. Okay, I'm going to unmute. Okay, I'm, I'm going to unmute everybody. How about that? Okay, I'm going to unmute all. It's too noisy. So, yeah, just why don't you just do it, everybody? Okay, everybody's on me. On me. So, Sonia, can you say something, please? No, I'm gonna hang up on the phone. I hope you're doing it on your computer, correct? Okay, it's everybody. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, Sonia. But I, I, I need okay, to, wonderful. Okay, just give me one minute. Let me pull up your slides, okay? Okay. 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 Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm, I'm going to mute right. everyone. Okay. okay, and hopefully you can un un unmute yourself because it's too noisy, okay? Okay. Give me a mute everyone. I'm going to mute everyone. Mute all. Okay, there you go. Let's give me one minute. Let me find your slides. It's, you have sent it to me. Give me a minute. There's your slides. Okay, Sonia, go ahead and now ad advance it to the next slide. Go ahead, Sonia. Okay, I have to um, unmute everyone, Sonia, for, because I, we can't hear you. We cannot hear you. Give me a minute, where's Sonia at, Sonia? There's a lot of people on the, on the line right now. The Sonia feels... So Sonia, okay, here you go. That's you. Sonia, something is wrong with your stuff. I'm gonna unmute every, everyone. So Sonia, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Want you? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. 
and and I apologize uh, about not being able to unmute singularly. So what I want to talk about um, are some pertinent things in this. Right. Sonia, can I time so that sorry. we're all dealing? With. Everybody, can you look in the lower left corner of the? Why don't you mute everybody? Just mute everybody. Mute everybody, please. Everybody mute yourself. No, so that Sonia will be able to mute. You know. Sonia, are you using your iPad? I am. That's is, that a, is that a problem? That's probably the, the, the problem. Can you go to a laptop? I'm going to go to somebody else. Okay. Okay. I'll okay. try to go to a laptop. All right. Okay. Are you online, Jerry? Yes. Okay. Jerry, I'm going to go to you. Okay. Sonia, we'll come back to you, okay? I'm here online. Tom. Yes. I am. Okay. Everybody, okay. So let me go to your slide. Gary, okay? Okay. You're going to turn the slides for us, correct? Yeah, I'm going to turn the slides for you. Just going to tell me where you turn your slides, okay? Why don't you have everybody mute their own phones themselves? Yeah, I, I will do that right now. Mute your phone. Okay. Whew. Thank you for your patience. We're trying to, we have about 80 people online. So I'm trying to manage everybody right now. So we are doing good. We're doing good. Uh, let me get. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. You guys are doing good. All right. You, you ready to go, Jerry? Okay, you go. There we are. All right, go ahead, Jerry. Unmute yourself. Hello, Jerry. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, Tom, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, my name is Jerry Vessel. Uh, I'm a good friend of mine, Tom Wise. We've been a, been friends for 20 years. He's the past president of Life Point Hospital Chain. He's also the past president and CEO of E Plus Cancer Center. He was he was at Life Point Hospital Chain for over 10 years. He decided to he got an opportunity to be uh, go to work for a hedge fund out of New York City and took over E Plus Cancer Center, ran that for a CFO for about six or seven years. And then his, the hedge fund wanted to sell the E Plus Cancer Center, so Tom did, did, did the process and put it together to sell the, sell the, sell the uh, E Plus Cancer Center to the hedge fund. His, you've got his resume on the, um, on the website, it's, it's phenomenal. But I want to introduce Tom, and we're gonna go through this presentation. I'm gonna speak on some slides, and Tom's gonna speak on some, okay? Go ahead, Dr. Coral. Okay. Okay, what, what we want to talk about a little bit today is in this time of uh, disruption and change is a time when you really need to step back and understand the financial aspects of your practice. And uh, you need to look at your business in the same rigor in which you take care of your patients or the same, in the same uh, detail in which you uh, uh, you know do your surgeries and so on, so you want to look at that in the with the eye of do you, is this what how you want your practice to look going forward? Because right now you're under stress and you really need to understand your profit margins, where your cash is, where your expenses are. And we'll talk a little bit about some of that in in detail. Uh, you can go to the next slide, doctor. 
<clears throat> okay, on this issue, we're going to talk about the um, I'll talk about the rent. Uh, so are doctors. I've, I've talked to them. They are uh, contacting their landlords and our bankers, and they are negotiating a lower rent amount or are not paying the rent for their, for their office buildings. And the landlords or the building owners are really open to that right now. They don't really like it, but they don't want to, they don't want to own a medical building. So they're, they're willing to work with the, with the tenants right now. Uh, the mortgages, I've talked to several bankers. Bankers are talking to our clients about renegotiating their rate and, and even deferring payments. So you, my recommendation to you is contact your landlord and or your banker and negotiate either a better term of rent or no rent or and contact your banker to get a better mortgage rate at this point in time. Okay, Tom. Okay, under employees, I think one of the things that we all do as we're as your physicians and practicing, you really focus on your your patients and maybe not how the roles and the responsibilities of each one of your employees. And that's one thing I think you should look at very closely, you know, and see are, are you operating as efficiently? Is everybody doing what you need them to do to support you as opposed to support what, what, what they desire? That may sound a little harsh, but you know, you every, every place has uh, its own culture and you want the culture to re revolve around you, your needs and your patients' needs uh, primarily. Um, and, and that may lead you to take a look at uh, your practice to design just a little bit differently. Uh, Jerry, is Ryan on to talk about the furlough? Uh, Ryan, you there? Ryan? Yes, Jerry, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, Ryan. Uh, uh, one option on, uh, on your employees, if they don't, uh, you can furlough employees right now for a week at a time. And I have Ryan um, on the phone. He's a, he's, he's a vice president. Of a, of a of the of a, the the what's what's the, what's a SBA well, loans well, in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I'm gonna have Ryan say a few words. Thanks, thanks, Jerry. Yeah, so right now you've probably heard about the CARES Act, that uh, the the large stimulus bill for businesses and individuals alike it, it caught a snag today in the Senate, but there is a uh, a a, a fairly sizable chunk of funds that has been set aside for small business interruption loans to the SBA. I specialize in SBA lending. I've been doing 100% SBA lending for the last 10 years, and um, I've, I've never seen anything uh, quite like this. It's, it's a pretty aggressive program, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about specifically what it's looking to do. The overarching goal of this program is to keep staff intact through uh, making a loan of up to $10 million to, to individual businesses to pay for currently the number of months that it's, it's allotting is four months of expenses such as payroll, benefits, your mortgage payment, your rent payment, utilities, um, and other, other common business uh, working capital type expenses. Uh, this loan is going to be at well below market rates. There's going to be no requirement for collateral for this loan. There's going to be no fees charged for this loan. And there is no requirement of a personal guarantee for this loan. In addition, the SBA uh, has also uh, communicated to us that they understand that in this time of tightened cash flows, taking on additional debt service or monthly payments is not something that's, that's really a good idea. So they've also discussed up to a 12-month payment deferral on this loan. Um, in addition, another feature that looks very attractive is Currently, the way that it's written, and, and a, a lot of these a lot of these requirements are, are, are up for change still, but currently the way that it's written is uh, that the funds that are used for payroll, payroll support type uh, spend, um, upon the SBA confirming it post-closing that you use those funds for payroll and you retained employees or the same number of full-time employees, um, they will forgive that portion of the debt without a tax penalty to the borrower. 
So this is a pretty, um, it's, it's, it's a very unique uh, loan program. I, I will say that, that a number of the details are still being ironed out. Um, my recommendation to uh, business owners right now is to begin collecting uh, basic loan file information, your, your annual P&L, your year-end P&L balance sheets, um, your tax returns, um, your entity documents, your, your bylaws and, and operating agreements, things of that nature, uh, to be prepared to present a loan file when the time comes. Because if, let, let's say this bill passes tomorrow, it's still going to take a number of days for the SBA and the Treasury to iron out exactly how this how we're going to process these loans and fund these loans. Um, but this is going to be available for all companies with 500 or less than 500 employees. So it's, it's a pretty, um, they're, they're, they're painting with a pretty broad brush as far as the companies that can benefit from this program. Uh, that's what we know about it now. There's going to be substantially more to come in, in the days moving forward. Uh, I will say this is different than the existing SBA disaster loan program that is currently available to you. One of the big differences between these two loans is the SBA disaster loan program. You go directly to the SBA on their website. If you were to Google SBA disaster loan, you will go directly to the website, <clears throat> the sba.gov website and see the application to get started with that loan. Uh, totally different loan program. The SBA disaster loan does not have any debt forgiveness type require or uh, debt forgiveness type features like this. This CARES Act is is currently describing, um, but it does have fairly flexible repayment terms and below interest rates, and uh, it, it's something that you can apply for immediately. Um, I would also encourage you to. It sounds like we have a number of folks on the phone today, so I would also encourage you to look for um, state-sponsored uh, business interruption loans. I've heard of some in New York and Texas. Um, the, the largest amount I've heard of there is about 75000 for business interruption, but uh, I know every little bit helps. So those are, those are some of the, the resources that I, I just wanted to, to mention on the call tonight. Thanks. Okay. Can you, um, Jerry, can I ask him to repeat the part about forgiveness? I want to. Yes. I heard that. Go ahead, Ryan. Sure, Dr. Coro. So currently, the way that the bill is 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 written. So let's say you borrow a hundred thousand dollars in this to uh, a mixture of paying employees, rent, utilities, other overhead items. Of that, seventy thousand dollars is spent in payroll and employee benefits. Once the loan is closed and that, that money's been funded, you paid that out to your employees. I don't know what the mechanism is going to be yet, Dr. Coro, uh, but the SBA is going to develop a mechanism that allows you to show to the SBA that you have spent these loan proceeds on your employees and, uh, for these eligible spends, and their intent is to... Uh, to convert that into that loan, that portion of the loan into a grant and basically provide you with tax-free loan forgiveness or debt forgiveness. So it's, it's gonna be complex, but that's, it's possible for the, for the SBA to forgive the loans. It, it, the SBA is willing to forgive the portion of the loan that is spent on employee payroll and payroll support. The, the main goal of this, this part of this stimulus is to keep employees employed and keep businesses afloat. But the only debt forgiveness is for money spent. So in my example, if you spent 70,000 out of the 100,000 towards your employees payroll, you would, you would be eligible for forgiveness of 70,000. The other 30,000 you would be required to pay back. Okay. Well, uh, uh, thanks Ryan. I, uh, going to the next bullet point, May not be relevant if you're looking at the uh, at the, uh, the the loans, but uh, although terminate termination may be a harsh word, uh, you, you some of you all all 
already may be doing that just for financial reasons. And the people that you want to keep, you may, you know, there may be incentives you want to give them that you can't maybe pay their whole salary, but you can give them, uh, uh, cover their benefits and so on. I get with my accountant on, on that, but, uh, uh, obviously, the the government's pretty serious here, and it sounds like you you know you can help your people, which is a very important thing. Uh, let Jerry take the next slide. Okay, the ne this slide is evaluate your staff. Uh, that's the slide we got, Dr. Crow. Keep that up, please. No, no, no back one. Yeah, you know. back one. Yeah. Okay, uh, key staff that you retain. Uh, your staff that comes on board, you're going to be servicing some patients. I had those people. Uh, your patients to the highest level as you do now. Uh, keep your staff on board if they're working and you and you capitalize on this SBA loan feature and you can pay their salary and you keep people that are working. You can have your, and if you don't have the patients coming in, you can have your staff market to your clients and, and to market to your existing clients and to, and, and to market to grow your business to get new patients. Also use your talents, so contact your staff when you're talking to them because several people have dual talents. So if your staff, if you don't have patients, have them work inside your office as far as fix up your office. I have one doctor, he's got his staff painting, his, painting some of their office rooms. They are preparing luncheons for, for the entire staff. Uh, so use the talents of your staff. If you're going to have them there set, set there working and you don't have patients, have them perform some kind of a function since you're commit you're paying their entire salary okay we're done go ahead next next slide this slide talks that some of you may employ doctors in your practice um and one of the things that you will have to do during this time of reduced income is take a close look at that contract you have because you may be no matter uh what you may want to do you may be be held up to a, a contractual standard that uh, you, you must meet. Uh, but you also wanna take a look at this time to say, is this how I really wanna structure my employed physician or physicians? And again, going back to as we talked about at the very beginning of the, uh, uh, of the presentation, this is a time to take a step back and look at how you want your practice to look moving forward and really dig into the, the, to the, uh, to the contract and is it what you, what you, what you want and what will be best be able to allow you to survive in the future. Again, a lot of times you sign a contract and everybody just puts it aside. Now's the time to kind of look at it and make sure you understand the responsibilities. Make sure that the physician, I'm not saying this in a derogatory sense, it's more like let's make sure we understand what's going on and given, given this hard time, which it seems about every 10 years we hit a hard time, uh, you know, you wanna make sure that you uh, have something in there that allows flexibility. So you can move to the next slide, please. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, your patients that you're losing, you, had, you don't have appointments for now, that you're canceling appointments, or your patients are. Uh, what I would be doing is I'd be contacting all my patients and book them out uh, about two or three months out, and, and with the, with the, we'll have to book it out further. But I would be working my existing patients that you're canceling appointments on and getting those booked out so that when, you, when this thing lifts, which is maybe in two or three months, we don't know, but I would have my entire calendar booked from that point on. And also, if you have patients that need additional cost or additional help right now and they can't afford it, it's a hardship, you know, it's always a goodwill and, and God's grace to, give, to help people out now. So, you know, I would just tell them, say, look, if you need help, I'll help you out. And, don't, you don't owe me any money. Um, come back uh, when you get well, and we'll take care of it. So I'd make patients aware of these concessions and help people out. I think it's the time that everybody needs to bind together. Next slide. Mail service. That's I'll take that one. So that's the uh, mail service. We contacted the postal service. They're telling us that the mail that comes in has could have the virus on it for up to three days. You're personal and local business mail. So uh, we are recommending that uh, you put your mail uh, in three different stacks and, and let it set for three days before you open it unless you, uh, and then, and then, and then wipe, wash your hands aggressively when you open your mail. So they're saying the virus could stay, stay uh, the postal service was telling us is 
that the buyers can actually stay on these envelopes that they deliver for up to three days. So we're recommending you stack your mail three days time. And we do that just in our business, and we also do it in my home. I have boxes in my garage that I keep three mail on for three different days and uh, do the third day, third day. So just be extra cautious. And we did talk to the Postal Service. They confirmed that. Tom, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Coral. Yeah, this, this slide talks about uh, the variable costs, and those can be looked at. Uh, it's kind of your, your little cost, but one of the things that I've found is we've I've been involved in organizations where we run clinics and, and uh, uh, our bot clinics, our employed physicians, and come in and run their office. There's a lot of things that people just forget about that you're paying for. I do what we would do is a line by line audit of everything that you have that you're that you're spending money on, and you know, you you may already have this under complete control, or, or you may get surprised that wow we're still doing that, or you know why do we need to keep doing something like this? And again, it's 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 probably nothing that's uh, a great amount, but if you save five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars a month. You know, that's, uh, that, that, that's the money that you can be spending on your patients or your staff in the future. So again, just look at, the, get down into the detail and into the nitty gritty uh, with this, again, the same vigor in which you take care of your patients. Next slide. Yeah, we're also telling all of our clients to look at their benefit programs, the disease or disability contracts, there are life in, corporate life insurance, deferred comp plans, executive bonus plans, uh, their E&O coverage, their PNC coverage. Make for certain that they have a they don't the, that they have a good benefit package. But also a lot of these contracts that uh, they have so like the, some a lot, lot, lot of co corporate life insurance contracts and deferred comps. Uh, they're they're informally funded and there's cash available in these contracts. Uh, you can um, defer payments for you know, several months or years. Um, I've got several clients that have deferred comp plans for their doctors as a retention program. And, you know, there's got, you know, anywhere from 50 to a couple hundred thousand dollars of cash. The corporation has access to that money if they need it. So it's just available money and they, and they don't have to pay it back if they don't want to. Uh, check your E&O coverage, make sure you have exactly what you, what you need in line and your contact your PNC, make sure you have the exact limits you need, but no more. And also he handles your health insurance. So review your health insurance programs to make sure all the employees are covered properly, but you might want to re readjust your premiums to, uh, 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 to a higher deductible, better cost. All I'm saying is look at all your benefit packages carefully, your 401ks, everything. And at this time, point in time, you may want to adjust your thing for the next you know, six to 12 months, okay? So, Perry, you, you have about uh, two minutes, please. Okay, go ahead. So th th this, again, the, you can re read this. It's basically, make, j just take a look at what your cash in and your cash out is going uh, over the next several months and what you're going to need and then figure out a way to, to cover that and, and being making decisions on your practice. Right. Next line, next slide. Go ahead. So, so again, as we mentioned earlier, you're trying to take a look at your practice and really dive into it in detail and position it to handle a similar situation in the future and be as efficient as possible. But you also may be looking at how do I want to practice into the future? Uh, is this the, 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 the complexity and the, uh, and the volume that I want or do I want more? And this will give you a chance to look at, you know, how do I, how do I, uh, place myself in a position to hire other physicians or just to take care of my own practice. But again, you're looking at the future. So be safe and God be with you all because these are, these are hard times. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, that wonderful. We're going to have uh, questions. Um, Jerry, you want? Well, we got Jay, Jay Jay Moore, and Mark. Jay Moore. So I do, I, I'm sure some of us have some questions for you. Let's ask some questions before we go to Jake and more. Let's ask two questions and we'll move on. Because you did okay. mention about life insurance and stuff like that. My, I have my own question is, can you halt your life insurance payment or any of those um, things that you mentioned, is that possible? Yes, you can. If you have a life insurance contract, it's a permanent life insurance contract, it's got cash value in it. 
uh, you can uh, you can uh, do, uh, you can halt your payments. You can take a loan on the contract. Uh, there, a lot of those loans are wash loans because you borrow the money at four percent. It's got a credit rate of four percent, so really you're out of pocket, no capital. So there's lots of options you would have. So I would I would say check, talk to your advisor to see what your options are on your, all your contracts. You can do that. Yes. Okay. Does any anybody have any questions for Jerry before we go to the next presenter? You can unmute yourself. Um, my name is Deji Otegwe from Orlando. Um, is there a difference between cutting hours and if employees decide to leave when you cut the hours as opposed to um, firing them as it relates to the bill? That, some of that will depend on your, your, your state law. Uh, I think I saw where there's a presenter here that has some expertise in that, but usually what you're looking with regard to um, uh, unemployment benefits and what you're liable for, in general, if someone leaves of their own accord, they leave it, they, they, you, you're, not, you're not liable for anything. Um, but that's in general, but you, you, you'd have to take a look. I think there's somebody on here that I saw that might be able to answer that question. Does anybody have an expertise? I just uh, hear the distance. I say, every day, oh, my, hey, my, hey, my others. I'm listening to my. Who's speaking? My to the call. Hello? Okay. Does anybody have expertise? Uh, I think uh, uh, Bella Law, are you online yet? Are we? Please, I do have yes. one question. This is a way. I, I, I am online. Okay. Can you, are you able to comment on that or do you want to wait until your, your, your presentation? Yeah, if it's okay, I'd like to wait to my presentation. That's okay. Good. All right, fine. All right. Um, this is Dr. Madu, and I have a question. What ahead. are the acronyms E and O and P and C? Arizona Missions, Property and Casualty. Can you say that again? Arizona Missions and Property and Casualty. Missions and what? Property and Casualty. D Dr. Koro, I think. Okay. Um, the Arizona Mission, as far as physicians are concerned, is a malpractice insurance. That's what he's Malpractice referencing. insurance. Yeah. Okay. Same thing. Okay. Jerry, next time we're doctors, malpractice insurance is better. I understand. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go to... Um, Jake and John. Jake okay. and jo uh, Jonathan Constant. And then after that, um, Sonia, I hope you fix your problem. Okay. I'm here with Jake, and Jake Moore and John Constant, in Atlanta, Georgia. They're my financial planning partners in Atlanta, Georgia. We have uh, several doctors, medical practice we work with together on. So I'm going to have Jake and John talk for a few minutes. And uh, you guys take off, Jake. All right. Hey, everyone. This is John Constant. Uh, Jerry, Tom, Ryan, thank you very much for the information. And, and Jerry, thank you for the introduction. Dr. Okoro, thank you for inviting us to, uh, to take part in the conversation this evening. Um, as Jerry was mentioning, uh, my partner, Jake Moore, and myself uh, focus primarily on financial planning and wealth management for high income and high net worth individuals and families. Um, we recognize the majority of this call is, is obviously dedicated to the immediate, which is taking care of your medical practices, your patients, your employees. Um, but what we thought we could offer tonight was maybe four simple steps to consider as you turn to thinking about how COVID-19 has impacted your personal planning and investments. Um, I would suggest, you know, this is a time to be in contact with your financial planner if you have one or to consider employing a planner if you don't. Um, because there's decisions to be made and some of the actions um, that can be taken in your personal planning um, in the here and now are going to have a profound positive impact on you, your family, and, and your wealth a decade or more from now. So um, the four simple steps that we wanted to, uh, to point out on the, on the personal wealth management side, step one is, is just don't panic, right? So it's, um, it's human nature that the pain of loss is three times greater than the joy of gain. And undoubtedly, you know, many of you have probably logged into your 401ks, your IRAs, your brokerage accounts. If, if you don't log in online, you're going to start getting some statements here uh, in a couple of weeks for, uh, for the month of March. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to feel that pain of loss uh, that I'm referring to. 
Um, with that being said, you know, I think ultimately how you react to that is, is you're going to have three different options. So your first option is you can stay invested for the long haul. Your second option is you can go to cash. Uh, so you could panic and you could sell everything. Or maybe option three is somewhere in the middle where you say, you know what, I'm just going to be out of the stock market. I don't want to be in any uh, risk assets. And maybe I'm just going to put all my money in, in 10 year U.S. Treasury bonds. Um, what I could share with you as an example is if you just go back to the last bear market of 2008 and 2009 and, and think about how these uh, three strategies that I mentioned played out, assume that you, know, you had 100000 invested with 60% in stocks or equities and 40% in bonds in your portfolio on October 9th, 2007. Uh, that date, what's, what's pertinent about that date, October 9th, 2007, is that was actually the market peak. Of, uh, of the prior bull market prior to, to, to this last one that just ended here uh, a few weeks back. And if you had pursued those three different paths that I talked about as of uh, all the way uh, going into September 30th, 2008, um, that was two weeks after Lehman Brothers collapsed, um, uh, you would have had very, very different outcomes in terms of, of, of your ending amount of wealth. So. Again, your first option would have been to rebalance your portfolio, stay invested, stay the course, and do annual rebalancing on your investments. The second option would have been to sell everything to cash, and the third option would have been to buy treasuries. Had you done that um, on, uh, two weeks after Lehman Brothers collapsed, and you fast forward the tape to March 31st of 2019, um, your first option would have yielded uh, or resulted in an ending port portfolio bal balance of just under $180,000. So you would have had positive returns despite that huge setback in the financial crisis, you would have had positive returns staying the course over that time. If you had panicked two weeks after Lehman Brothers hit and you had sold all your investments to cash and you had stayed in cash until March 31st, 2019, you would have ended up with a net loss. You would have only had $88,000 uh, at the end of that time period. And had you uh, pursued the third uh, uh, path and you would have sold all your assets and went into U.S. Treasuries, at the end of that 10-year period, you would have had 116000 So. Um, you know, I'm not a great uh, uh, scientist like many of you uh, on the line with medical degrees, but I do know simple math that 180,000 is substantially more than 88,000 or 116,000. So I would implore you not to uh, not to panic and to, to uh, stay the course. Um, you know, I think the real lesson in that is is that, look, markets can obviously be volatile over short periods of time. But for people that have a long-term perspective, um, you know, what we can share is that modern equity markets work better in terms of generating wealth than any other asset class in history. So step one is just stay the course. Step two uh, is to evaluate what's taking place. Um, so I thought maybe I could shed some light on what's happening in financial markets as a result of, of COVID-19. Um, you know, one question that we're being posed right now is, is what's the current state of liquidity across financial markets? What I could share is that some markets similar to that time period of the last financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 <clears throat> are clearly troubled. Um, some of those troubled uh, markets uh, would be like short-term commercial paper, um, which is just short-term loans amongst banks and corporations. There's been some trouble there even prior to COVID uh, breaking out, um, and the Fed has had to inject a lot of capital to, to shore up that, play, that space. Um, high yield bonds, uh, commonly referred to as junk bonds, is another area that's really under a lot of stress. A lot of that has to do with the cost, the price of oil. There's just been an, a collapse of demand for oil out there, and a lot of the high yield market is propped up uh, by energy companies, and so they're obviously going through a tough time, and we would expect to, uh, to see some defaults there. But even markets outside of the big headlines, outside of energy or outside of the short-term uh, commercial paper market, we are seeing uh, some stress in markets. Um, that's evidenced by the bid-ask spreads uh, being substantially wider than is normal in equity markets and municipal bond markets, and the same thing in investment grade. So I think the important takeaway to that is that while markets are presently stressed, the actions that the Federal Reserve is taking, the actions that the ECB is taking, the actions that they're taking in the UK, the actions that are be taking, being taken in China and, and the rest of the globe, frankly, particularly in larger economies and global markets, are keeping markets operating. So, you know, people like us that are in our roles do have the ability to access markets on behalf of our clients. The markets are functioning, and I would anticipate that as long as those markets function, it will help us out of this. 
um, uh, uh, longer term as, as we go through this time. Uh, another question that people are asking is, are we at the bottom? Um, you know, I, I'm not going to, you know, try to take out my crystal crystal ball and, and be a wizard or a sorcerer and tell you when, when the bottom of, of the market is going to be here. Um, but I do have some observations and, and some signs that we'll look for in terms of recovery um, uh, in the markets. Um, you know, one observation would be that historical, the historically rapid and even violent selling um, that we've experienced over the past couple of weeks seems to have abated uh, with the announcements of monetary and fiscal stimulus efforts. We've really just seen that over the last couple of days. If you look at futures right now, tomorrow morning looks like futures are going to be up on the Dow, maybe a couple hundred points. That's a normal range of volatility. So I, I think I'm, I'm hoping that the major volatility we've had will start to subside and we'll go into a more normal period. I think um, uh, another thing uh, that we could look for is a reduction um, in, in market volatility in terms of equity prices and bond yields. And then probably the biggest thing that's going to signal that we're turning around um, is going to be a plateauing of new COVID-19 cases. I think when, when we see that plateau start to happen and we start to have a decrease in new cases, I would suspect that we'll start to, start to see financial markets really start to, uh, to recover. Um, the long-term impact on the global economic growth and earnings, look, it's going to be a lousy second quarter. Um, I don't think anybody is going to be surprised by that. It's not going to be a good second quarter in your businesses. It's not going to be a, a good second quarter in, in big global businesses in all likelihood. Um, you know, the question is, is how far down do we go and how quickly uh, does it come back? Our base case right now is that we will finish 2020 um, with uh, uh, mid single digit uh, uh, reduction in growth globally. Um, so we will, we are predicting the base case that we'll have a global recession. If we are in those low or mid single di digits in terms of economic contraction, we think that markets uh, might frankly be undervalued right now. Um, but, you know, that assumption is obviously based on, on a lot of things working out in terms of us getting through the worst of the virus here in Q2. Jay, can you conclude in two? Uh, in two? So um, with that, I, I think that's probably a good opportunity to transition to um, uh, point three and four, uh, which is our team certified financial planner, Jake Moore, uh, can talk a little bit about the planning that needs to be done. Thanks, John. And uh, again, thank you to Dr. Okora for putting this together. Um, everybody's done a great job presenting. Um, so I'm Jake Moore. I am uh, our team's uh, certified financial planner. Um, so just wanted to bring up, look, I can't stress enough. Uh, if you're not working with a, an advisory practice or wealth management practice that implements comprehensive financial planning, um, I, I suggest you find one. Um, you know, I'm going to talk today just really quickly um, about, you know, what, what a financial plan means to us. You know, we look at six key areas. That is uh, your current financial position um, is one. So that's like a cash flow analysis, right? Um, especially most of you being uh, specialty surgeons or elective surgeons, uh, you know, just here in the last few weeks, you're looking at your cash flow. Um, it's changed substantially, right? Um, so I can't stress enough, you know, going back and working with a planner to see, all right, well, worst case scenario, um, if my cash flow looks substantially different throughout the rest of the year, uh, what does that look like? Um, here's best case scenario. What can I do to reduce cost? Uh, what can I do um, to reduce, uh, you know, my budget and actually use that excess cash to, to help you stay afloat here from a personal aspect? Um, the second being uh, risk management, a uh, fancy word for insurance. Jerry touched on it earlier, um, but a comprehensive review of, of, of your insurance programs, right? Um, you know, permanent life insurance, uh, most of that holds a cash value that can help you pay your premiums. That can also provide liquidity to you uh, and your family in a tax-free way. Um, you know, your net worth may have changed substantially. You may be overinsured. You may be paying for insurance that, frankly, you don't need. Um, by, by really evaluating your financial plan, uh, you can find those holes, save yourself some money, uh, find liquidity. Um, the third would be wealth accumulation. Um, you know, my assumption is uh, a lot of you may have uh, children that you've been doing um, some college education planning for. Uh, with the recent market drop, your 529s have probably lost some money. So reevaluate uh, those projections as to 
where are you going to be? Do you need to start saving more? Um, do you need to adjust those asset allocations um, for different programs for you know big purchases uh, that you may have in the near future? Um, the fourth would be tax planning, and you know I guess uh, in situations like this, you really have to try to turn lemons into lemonade. Um, I do think from a planning perspective uh, that there are a couple opportunities from uh, tax planning as it involves investments. Uh, one being with your non-retirement investments. Uh, this is really a great time uh, to utilize proper tax loss harvesting. Um, you're, you basically have an opportunity here uh, really over the next few months to reset your cost basis uh, in those non-retirement programs. You're not missing any time in the market. Um, you know, you're, you're resetting your cost basis. So when you do need that money down the road, right, you're not paying uh, large capital gains taxes. Um, the, the other thing is, you know, you get uh, one uh, with tax loss harvesting, you get every single year, you can uh, write off $3,000 of losses uh, towards your taxes. Uh, I, would, I would absolutely recommend that you guys are, are recognizing that 3000 and then also uh, you know, selling off losses and taking gains to offset gains that you may have uh, throughout the year. Um, second thing with tax planning uh, in your retirement accounts, uh, this is a, a huge opportunity from our perspective uh, to utilize uh, Roth conversions, right? So in your IRAs, uh, what you can do is you can convert portions of your IRA uh, that's now down, right? You can convert it to a Roth IRA. Roth IRAs, uh, are tax free when you take them out. They also pass on your beneficiaries tax free. Again, you're not losing any time in the market. Uh, you're transitioning from uh, you're transitioning money that's going to be taxable in the future into an account uh, that where the money is going to be tax free. Um, I would only suggest that if you do have excess cash on hand to pay those taxes. Um, fourth thing is retirement planning. Uh, so in your retirement plans, um, you know obviously. Uh, Mm -hmm. we, if you can conclude, because I have a lot of other people to, to pre present. We're almost out of time. Yep, uh, I'll conclude here real quick. So with your retirement plans, work with your advisors, uh, redo those projections. Uh, you may need to work longer. Uh, you, you, know, you may need to uh, adjust your risk tolerance. Um, you, know, you also, uh, you, I would coincide that with your cash flow as well. Um, so I can't stress enough, uh, talk to your financial advisors, talk to your planners, um, update these plans, and it, it should give you peace of mind and, and take the emotions and the fear uh, from the personal side out of this entire situation, because this too shall pass. Um, all right, Dr. Coro, thank you. Thank you very much, Jake. Uh, thank you, um, Jerry. I'm going to go to Sonia if she's uh, ready to go. Sonia, are you ready? Sonia. Sonia, you can unmute yourself. Are you on, Sonia? Hi, Sonia. How are you now? I'm fine. Okay. Um, can you see a slide, Sonia? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so, do you have noise behind you? No, it's not coming from over here. Okay, Sonia, I'm going to mute everyone. You, you have you figured out how to unmute yourself, correct? Yeah, no problem. You can mute all the lines and then I can unmute myself. Okay, I'm going to mute everybody. And then, Sonia, go ahead and un unmute yourself. You can hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, good, um, good evening, and, and thank you, Dr. Cora, for having um, me um, present tonight. And I know this is very difficult time for everyone. Thank you, everyone out there that's on the call. I can you speak louder, Sonia? Come closer and speak louder so we can hear you. Okay. Is that 
that better? Yeah. Okay, okay, awesome. Um, just wanted to introduce myself. So I am a wealth management advisor um, with Merrill Lynch. Um, I am a certified financial planner. Um, I'm a certified plan financial advisor as well as a, a certified retirement plan um, counselor. Um, I have with me Gia Surratt. Um, she's a small business specialist and she has been in the business for 12 years. And we're, we're going to talk tonight um, about what's most important and what's on everyone's mind now. Uh, we're not going to talk about investments, but we're really going to talk about cash flow and how do you um, access cash flow in times of crisis and in this time of crisis. And if you could go to the first slide, Dr. Oberon. And so the topics um, that we're going to deal with are things that are small things that I think all of us should really be aware of. Uh, I know some of the callers or presenters earlier talked about the um, the $2 trillion relief uh, program that is being unrolled um, and what that means. There are some things that are available right now that we can all take advantage of. Um, for Bank of America, that is a part of Merrill Lynch, um, there are several things that we're doing currently and other banks are also doing that. A consumer and small business deposit account, um, if you call and for any of these things you have to call and let the bank know and the customer service um, department know that you would like to request these, um, these benefits because they will not give them to you automatically. So one, they will refund fees, overdraft, non-sufficient fees, monthly maintenance fees will all be refunded for up to nine months and sometimes they'll do it for 12 months. Um, consumer and small business credit cards. Um, currently, um, all banks are doing this. You can call and defer all payments on your small business or credit card, personal credit card. Now, the interest um, payments don't go away. The interest payments are still there added on to the balance, but there are no late fees. There are no re negative reporting on your, um, to the credit bureaus. And again, you can defer the payment. And they'll defer payments currently for up to 60 days. And the 60 day deferment applies to, again, small business loans. It applies to auto loans and mortgages. Again, if you have a mortgage that you're paying $4,000 a month, and if you're in a situation right now where your cash flow for the next two or three months could be very uncertain, which a lot of us are in, you can call and they would defer the payments. The payments get added back onto the back of the loan. Um, there's no negative reporting and you can re-emphasize this with the lender um, to you. It does not show up as a late and there are no late charges for doing so. So those are things that I really, really recommend if you feel that cash flow could be an issue for the next um, three months. We don't know how long this will last. At least do that for the next 60 days. So you're freeing up some cash and you have some liquidity to face some of what's um, coming up next. Um, I am going to let Gia um, jump in and talk about swap loans. I think that's an important thing that many of you may have, some may have, and some may not. So Gia, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you, Sonia. Um, <clears throat> just to um, reiterate what um, Sonia was stating, a lot of these services that um, are being provided are not being sourced out, like just how like, you know, the bank will call you when times are good and offer you a loan or offer you refinance or something like that. But in this type of situation, they're not going to call you to tell you about the program they have designed. But immediate, so it's very it's extremely important for you to be the one to proactively call, um, reach out to your banker, reach out to your branches if you don't have a dedicated banker, and have um, you know have these conversations. 
just so you know, immediately when everything kind of with the race and everything started going downhill, the all banks across the uh, across the country went into recovery mode. So they're utilizing their time and um, also bringing in more help from other departments of the bank to figure out ways to be able to retain your loans and be able to offer their you know assistance as need be scenarios. Swap loans, um, I'm not sure, they're not typically done, but if you are heavy in real estate or have a relatively higher net worth, that is something that you know typically gets offered to you because it's a better way for you to get a better rate and also get some money back for doing your loans with the particular bank that, you, that you're doing your loan with. So in some of those cases, um, what swap loans um, are based upon is how the market is currently doing with the rates. And then of course, you know, you have your fixed rate. So with the swap loan, they typically give you a credit back, um, whatever the difference is for whatever the rate is currently according to the market and the, the fixed rate that you agreed upon. So in those cases, a lot of people are concerned in those areas as far as like their payments, and you know, if they miss a payment because of swap loans, you really cannot miss a payment. It reaches the agreement. So um, in those cases, once again, if you reach out to your banker um, or whoever your capital market person is, they'll be able to assist you because they have deferment assistance in that area as well. And a lot of people aren't aware about that either. Um, that's Thank it. You, Thank you very much. Um, then the next thing that I'd like to talk about, um, so we're going to talk about freeing up. So Sonia, you are far. Sonia, can't hear you. Come closer to the mic, please. Sorry, we're um, science using calling me since her a mic wasn't working, and then I have the phone to the speaker. So oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> okay. Okay. Go ahead, Sonia. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> All right. Much Can better. you hear me now? Yes, it's okay. good. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So the, the next thing that I'd like to talk about, um, really, um, a lot of people have most of their assets in their 401k plans, right? And so, um, fortunately, with the CARES Act, um, and this is being rolled out, there is a, a way to get significant relief through your 401k plan. So we know as a wealth management advisor and, and a, a planner, um, one of the things that I always emphasize is that we have to make sure that the funds that we have for retirement are for just that, is for retirement. In times of crisis though, we need to know that there are liquidity there that we can use so that we can get through the crisis. Um, the CARES Act, is going to allow you to do hardship withdrawals. And hardship withdrawals exist now, but the way it exists now, you get a 10% penalty on the money that you've taken out for early withdrawal if you do it before age 59 and a half. In addition to the 10% penalty, you're subjected to um, your regular income tax rate, whatever that is. So for some people, it could be upwards of 30% that they're paying on a hardship withdrawal. Through the CARES Act, instead of being able to take out just $50,000 in a loan out of your 401k, they're allowing up to 100,000. And instead of paying 10% penalty, there's no penalty. There is still the, um, the tax, regular income tax on the loan if you're not able to pay it back within a year. So that's new as well. Through the CARES Act, the amount that you take out up to $100,000, you can put back within a year and it then is not reported as a distribution from your 401k. So that could be a huge benefit for a lot of people um, to really get them through um, the financial hardship that we're looking at and really, really uncertain times. Other area, and we can go to the next slide, Dr. Okora, is to freeze your cash balance plan or your defined benefit plan. And so a lot of people are not aware 
that the funds that you, for practice owners, you set up a cash balance plan, profit sharing plan for your employees and for yourself, which is very beneficial in terms of tax savings. But it is a significant um, payment towards taxes. So for 2020, for this year, if you're periodically taken out towards that plan, you can freeze that plan. The monies that you've set aside, because they're not really recorded yet, they don't get recorded to next year, those could be used. And the freezing of your plan, it could be for a year, it could actually be up to two years. And there's no penalties, there's no um, risk that this plan is going to be eliminated or being forced to close because of freezing it. Um, and so what is the process to freeze the cash balance or defined benefit plan? The process to freeze the plan is to adopt an amendment. Um, and in doing so, you're providing notice to your employees, alerting them that it will be frozen. And the amendment is done with a TPA. So for most um, cash balance plans, um, if not all, there's a third party administrator that does the um, actuarial work for you. And they are also there to do the administration. So they will be able to do the amendment to freeze the plan. And the freezing of the plan, as I just mentioned, is not permanent. It does not terminate the plan and it can be unfrozen at a later date with an amendment. So for people who have practices that are in partnership with others and you have a cash balance plan in place, you have a profit sharing plan in place, that is something as a group you can talk about and really look at what are the cash flow that we've set aside for this plan. Could we use it in other ways during these uncertain times? So that's definitely something that I would look into. And so is there an extension of the nine, um, the September 15th filing for the plan that has not yet been announced, but that's something that we are looking to see if they also roll that into this relief package that will, uh, will be coming out within the next few days. Next slide, please. And so this was mentioned um, earlier. And so we won't go into the details of the, uh, of the slide, but the SBA Disaster Assistance um, Program in response to the coronavirus is available. And so there's a website, sba.gov slash disaster, that um, you all can go on. Um, on my next slide, I will talk about the steps towards accessing the disaster loan program. And step one really simply is to apply for the loan. And you would apply at the SBA secure website. Um, as a business of any size, you may borrow up to $2 million for physical damage. As a small business, which is um, 500 employees or less, there's a small agricultural cooperatives, small businesses engage in aquaculture, or private nonprofit organizations, you may borrow up to $2 million for economic injury. Um, there's a maximum business loan of $2 million. And as a homeowner, you may also borrow up to $200,000 for repair to replace um, your disaster damage primary resident. And again, be clear that this um, incident is being considered as a disaster. Um, step two is property verified, to properly verified and um, process the loan and to get a decision. And step three is the loan closing and funding process. Um, it's important to know that with these loans, um, as was even indicated before, these are not forgivable loans. In the relief package, the two trillion dollar release program that is being um, rolled out, the loans that you get through that program are forgivable loans if it is used um, to continue your business and to pay employees. Next slide, please. Next slide, Dr. Perl. Okay. 
All right, and again, this is um, required documentation for the um, SBA small business loans. And the documentation are similar to documents that um, you all would be familiar with as business owners, those of you who are business owners in applying for a loan. Um, and those business um, financial documents, your year-to-date profit and loss statement, your balance um, sheet, um, two to three years tax returns um, for your debt schedule for your business, um, and also in terms of your patients um, and your tracking of your upcoming um, business. If you have patients who have not canceled but pushed back their, appoint, um, their appointments, having a schedule of that is important so that you can show. And Gia, um, prior to going to just talking about the markets, I'll have you talk a little bit um, again about the SBA loans. Gia? Gia? Yes. yes. With the, well, um, Tanya, you, you kind of touched on everything um, with the relief um, loan. Um, another thing they have about a 10 day turnaround. That's something though that like your actual bank, like if you have an existing, is a difference. This is, that's a relief loan that um, Sonia was speaking of. But if you have an existing SBA loan and you're looking for a relief, you will want to talk to both your bank and the, S in the actual SBA because the bank handles the, handles the conventional side of the loan. So they'll be able to see about doing a deferment. But, but in some cases, like if you have an SBA 504, you're making two payments. So one to the actual conventional side and one to the SBA side. So you may be deferring your conventional side, but when discussing with your banker, make sure you're is doing both payments and are just the conventional. If they're saying just the conventional, then you will want to reach out to SBA yourself and see about deferring the SBA side of your payment. And that Thank is something that we are offering as well. Um, so okay. it's just a matter of being proactive, um, kind of analyzing your cash flow and forecasting if you think you're, you may have an issue, you know, making any of your loan payments, especially if you're trying to, you know, sustain, you know, payroll. That was a couple of things that were discussed. Um, areas of concern, maintaining, you know, your existing employees or not having to cut hours or cut checks to retain your employees. So if you're forecasting, you know, coming across those decisions, not making payroll because you're trying to make your loan payment, be proactive before you miss that actual payment because the banks will be more inclined to have a discussion with you prior to you missing a payment or being late on a payment than, you know, you being in the midst of, of doing all of that. Okay, thank you very much. And, and the, the last thing that, again, um, I am a wealth management advisor and a lot of what I do is investments. Um, I've gotten calls from many people um, about the market. And so we know that with the market downturn, although the, um, these times are scary, and I have this chart about the market cycle of emotions um, and, and where we are in this cycle, um, we saw optimism, excitement, and euphoria. The, the market was up 25% uh, last year, the, the S&P was. And then um, in the matter of weeks, we turned from euphoria to anxiety. And we're now between anxiety and fear. And some people say we're even at the stage where we're panicking. I've actually had many people call me to say, I want to sell it all. I mean, I want to go completely to cash. And I literally have to talk them down, um, as we say, talk them off the fence. And, and so with this cycle, we know that when people get to the very bottom, they're despondent. They feel that it can't get any worse. That's actually the point of maximum financial opportunity. Um, so when we look back at the cycles in 2008, when people thought they couldn't get any worse, that's where the buying cycle really starts. 
And after that, when the market goes up and people have hope and relief and then optimism, you feel uh, you find a lot of people trying to jump back in. But again, they pass the bottom of the market. And so, you know, just five five signs that we're looking at to to kind of tell us that are we at the bottom because I'm I'm getting this. Are we at the bottom? What should I buy? And so one in terms of when we get to the bottom, there are five things that we look for. We we must see capital must flow freely. And so with this um, this two trillion dollar relief um, program, the market rallied. The market responded to it because we could see that capital could possibly start flowing freely. Um, freely, um, there are opportunities to free up cash so people will have it to use. And we talked about some of that today. And I hope you all use um, some of those strategies. The other thing is bond versus equity. And we need to start seeing that inverse relationship that we used to have. And where when your interest rates go up, your bond values go down. And it's same thing for equities, go up, bond goes down. And so to, to see that again, that's another indicator. And to facilitate um, the to facilitate that um, bonds versus equity. The other thing that we need to look at is volatility beginning to reside. So we had a couple of updates in the past couple of days, and I have to warn everyone, this is not it. We will hit bottom again. Um, again, the, and, and we all know this, we have not seen the peak of the number of cases of coronavirus in this country. And when we see the peak and the death um, tolls unfortunately increase and the number of people being affected increase, the market is going to respond. So the market will go down again and we will have people panicking um, and, and afraid. And so that's where we come in in talking to them about where we are and what this means. And then the other, uh, the other thing that we're looking for is a sharp acceleration of the dollar. That is also an indicator. Uh, the last thing in the five things is bad news flow needs to be ignored. When we see that the bad news being reported in the news is not affecting the market directly every day, then we can start seeing that, okay, maybe we're near bottom. Um, in terms of what do we buy, common sense should rule with that. Um, and, and I tell people that all the time. And so when you think about what you buy, you think about what's going on in the market. And you think about the fact that um, we're all um, washing our hands and we're using Clorox. Believe it or not, some of the worst days in the market, the stock that stayed up was Clorox. Um, what are we all doing? We're home and we're watching Netflix. Not all of us, we're working, some of us are working. But those are the kind of things that you think about. Um, so companies like Diego, um, who, sell, who sell alcohol to restaurants, they're not selling alcohol to restaurants because the restaurants are closed. So is that a stock you buy during this time? Um, and again, for um, people, Uber and um, those types of services, we're not using those services now. So these are the that time, type of things that you think about in terms of what do you buy? What are the companies that are doing the testing, the laboratories that are doing the testing for this virus? Those are huge opportunities in buying those companies. Again, thank you for your time tonight. Um, we appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Okora. Hope you all have a great evening. And thank you, Gia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you all for having me. Yes. Thank you. Have a good evening. Um, does anybody have a quick question for Sonia before I go to the next presenter? Uh, Dan, are you online? Yeah, Dr. Okora, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Um, You're the loud or clear? <laughs> um, <laughs> loud. 
<laughs> I'm trying to um, be an IT guy tonight. Just clean up your, your talk. Okay, give me a minute. Um, All right, thank you. But yeah, um, there's, I'm, I, I, know, I know there will be a lot of overlap. So in the interest of time, uh, just introduce yourself. And if, there's, if, so, if the previous speaker discussed um, what you're going to say, if you wouldn't mind skipping it, and then let's kind of keep it short. I do, I still have an attorney on the line. I have a, an AMPA psychiatrist online. And I have okay. a, another person to conclude and kind of put things together. And then we we'll ha also have some people that want to share their, their experiences with us as well. Okay? All right, great. So that's what's going on. And I am looking for your slides, but there you go. Oops, that's the end of the slide there. I have a lot of slides, so it's, uh, it's gone. Okay, um, can you introduce yourself so far so we can... Uh, All right, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dan ODJ from... Our firm is called MD Capital and Wealth Management. We are a physician-only family office, and we're based in West Palm Beach, Florida. We, our services we provide to physicians only uh, include risk management, investment management, trust planning, and practice management. And through our team of attorneys uh, and accountants, we do uh, P&L reconciliation. And um, I've helped out Dr. Koro and I because I wrote everything out so I don't have to speak about it. So you can read the slides directly as they show up on the screen. And uh, if he's able to get them up. I'll start by, before he does that, understanding your insurance coverage. A lot of folks uh, have a lot of insurance and probably do not understand the coverages. Um, get all the facts about it. Uh, you do have, if you have practices that currently have business overhead insurance and you have type coverage currently, get those policies, contact your insurance brokers and get the policy and review the document to make sure that because you might have the opportunity to place claims. Um, secondly, if your practice is, is affected, make sure that the prior, prior speaker uh, mentioned a good record of your losses and expenses in the event you need to file a claim. Most importantly, you should get yourself, consult your legal counsel on how to make those claims on your existing policies because folks still have uh, disruptive, go to the second page. Um, a lot of practices do have disruptive insurance coverages. We call them business overhead coverages, insurances. So if you have those policies, get them out, dust them up, uh, call the agent, the insurance agent, and, and have a conversation about what your coverages include. This is separate and distinct from the actual COVID uh, funds that's coming from the, from the, from the government. Uh, make sure you consult and partner with your legal counsel. I have mine uh, that works with us. He's going to be coming on that next, the Belly Group, uh, to make sure to help you in filing your claims. Review your malpractice policies. Uh, the reason is, and also speak to your counsel in the event you get called up to assist in emergency cases outside your current policy arrangement. We've seen currently where doctors are getting called out to help out, just make sure your policy covers you in the event you get, you get called up. Second slide, please. Um, review your P&L, which you, the other gentleman had covered, uh, in the event of a shortfall to make sure you're able to uh, manage what you got. Um, have a plan around the minimum cash flow to keep your practice open. You can make that determination by drawing a model on your P&L. Uh, review all your existing loan documents and covenants, which hopefully that's out the window. Because in most cases, um, if there's a reduction in collection, it could trigger a default. And um, I'm not going to cover the, the, the next line. talks about your creditors or landlord vendors. Uh, those are all, I believe, currently covered under the COVID laws. Uh, but be sure to look at those documents in the event that we, go, we get past these whole things that we're going through now. Um, the last line has been covered. Um, by the Merrill Lynch lady, which I think you very clear. You have an opportunity there to, to get some of your, your, your uh, current liabilities forgiven or get some forbearance on them. I'll go to the last slide, Doc. And uh, in, the, in reference to the employee furlough and termination, uh, 
please do not do it alone. Get your legal counsel in the event you need to terminate non-essential employees uh, because it's very important um, for you to protect yourself. And since there's also a very short, a shortage in healthcare staffing out there right now, um, contact your local healthcare system because they might have a need for staff. So you could move, if you're in a rural area or you're near a rural area, you might have rural hospitals that don't have staff, or that short staff, so you don't necessarily have to furlough or terminate them. You can work out an arrangement to have those employees go help out at those local hospitals. And as far as the uh, $350 billion small business program package, uh, our, our senator from Florida, Marco Rubio, is the chair of the committee. Um, his thought was that you could obtain 250% of one month payroll to cover you in the process. So, and that number, I believe, from what he said, we don't know right now if it's built into the bill that was, that was passed. So it's very important to get a work closer with the team of advisors and stay updated on the language as how it reads in the final bill. Um, I didn't talk about what we do from an investment management perspective because I believe this is the most important part. Your practices represent the largest share of your network. So uh, I am here with based in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, most of you all know me. And uh, Dr. Okoro, I'll pass the baton to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. You've been a, a very long supporter of AMPA, and we appreciate your assistance. Um, Bella Law, are you uh, are still online? Yes, I am. Yes, I okay. am, Doctor. Good evening. Um, let me I let me pull up the slides. Give me a minute, okay? Yeah. While you do that, I'd like to apologize for the technical difficulties I had. I have with my um, video. Uh, no, no camera. No. My paralegal is gone for the day, and um, I'm just not good technically. That's why that's why God made paralegals. Is is that right? <laughs> okay, well, we are almost there. Don't say this one. Okay, I'm just trying to get to the there you are. Okay. Um yeah, I, I'll I'll be very brief. Um we 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 hope. <laughs> My, my presentation typically with AMPA has been um, usually described as the trouble, not the blow whistle presentation. And I present and talk about things that we should do in the event things go terribly wrong in our personal lives and in our business lives and how we should plan and prepare for those days. Where well, we're here now. Exactly. And so it's not that trouble, not the blow whistle. In certain quarters, the whistles are blowing. And so um, I just wanted to touch on a few things that um, we should start um, discussing and thinking about while we're going through this um, pandemic. One is your estate plan. If you haven't gotten one done, you should seriously think about getting it put together. If you have one done already, this is a very good time to review it. I know we are very busy, but um, in times like these, um, where the office is closed and you're not seeing patients, this may be a very, very good time to dust off that estate planning binder that you have and actually peruse through it to ensure that things are up to date. The last time you might have um, reviewed it, maybe you had fewer children, maybe you had fewer assets, maybe you had fewer liabilities. So it will be wise um, to use the downtime to review those items. Also, it will be also be a good opportunity for you to review your insurance policies um, I think all the financial advisors have discussed, touched on this, but it's also very important at this time to consider your life insurance, consider your, your, um, your um, disability insurance, and with the policies to ensure that the appropriate beneficiaries are named. If you have a trust, it's important that you've, you've completed the change of beneficiary forms so that um, 
the proceeds of the policy pour into the trust. Okay. Um, so I, I want yeah. to touch on this uh, just briefly because I, I, I know the laws are changing as we speak. Yeah. Well, this is a, um, this, this is a legal, this is a legal uh, employment, legal employment law uh, topics and full disclosure, I'm not an employment lawyer. I have a colleague that um, handles that sort of work. And um, I should just note that he and I will remain available throughout the week should you have specific questions regarding uh, following employees, employees living on, uh, on sick leave and um, the, the impact on the pandemic and the shutdown on um, the employer-employee relationship. Um, one of the things I would like to draw your attention to on, uh, on the um, employment issue is um, the first, first and foremost, most of the employment laws are state-specific. Secondly, they're, they're also um, guided by the employment contract or agreement you have if one is in place. So a good place to start in addressing all this is you must have, you, you have an employee handbook, you have your policies on PTO, and you have your employment agreement. That's a very good starting point in understanding the landscape of your relationship with the employee. In Florida, we are at, we're an at-will state. And so um, a lot of the um, rights of the employers are to be able to make those decisions to end um, employment relationships with um, employees. Um, but that said, I, um, I think a good starting point is to review your, the, your, um, your, your employee handbook, your policies on, on um, PTO, and whatever employee contracts you have with the employees to be able to determine what your starting point and what, what the specific question you have. And then at that point, you may want to consult with an, a labor and employment lawyer, um, my colleague, and, it will, and who will be available um, throughout this week to take um, any calls you guys have with questions on, on this matter. But in terms of getting into the um, nuts and bolts of the um, Emergency Paid Leave Act, Sick Leave Act, and um, the FMLA Act, I, um, I uh, would really like to stay clear of that because that's really not my area. Uh, Owe, um, we're going to have a, a not, another session on the empl employment thing next week, hopefully. Um, okay. I'm going to have your, um, hopefully, have your, um, your, your colleague. Um, I, the plan is to probably have about four or five lawyers to give us different opinions on this. Now, hopefully, the, this act will be more clear and pass Congress and everything. Uh, once it becomes law, we would like to know the, to the implication to, um, to our members. Is that okay? No, that's, that, that's perfectly fine with me. I just don't want to uh, speak out of turn and give you what a trust and a state lawyer would think is the, is the, uh, is the law on labor and employment. I don't want to do that. Okay, but in but in scrolling back to the estate planning stuff, um, I, I just want to touch on one more thing. You know, while you're reviewing your plans, it's very important that you know you if you have minor children, you've made you've made plans. God forbid, if anything happens to you, that you have, you're you're able to appoint a guardian for the minor children, and you let that 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 person know. It's one thing to have all these plans in place, but you have to let the um, important people that need to know, know about your plan. Um, so um, the, the, my, in, in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that um, the discussion up until this point has been about your business. But because of the circumstance we're in, you also have to think about your private life and your family. And so just like you have to plan for um, surviving your business, surviving the, the pandemic, you have to, as I'm sure you do, you have to have plans for protecting your family and looking after your family during this period. 
And those plans have to include, unfortunately, the possibility of you being incapacitated or the possibility of you not being around. And you have to put those plans in place and let the people that need to know know so that, God forbid, something happens, there's a plan that can be put in motion and everybody's taken care of. Thank you again for your time. And um, I will stay on the line for any questions you have. Yeah, we'll come back to you at the end. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate your, your service to AMPA. And th uh, by the way, everybody on this, uh, all of our presenters have agreed to volunteer their time to, to help AMPA out. There's no financial, we're not paying them. They're, this is their volunteering. AMPA is a volunteer organization and thank you very much. Um, let me go to uh, Amy, can you conclude then I'll go to do do Dr. Anyo, who are you online? Yes, I'm online. Okay, uh, Amy, are you there? If Amy is not there, I'll go to Dr. Oku or Anyo Anyoku. I am here, thank you very much. Okay, uh, um, Amy, yeah, we're going to give you five minutes to conclude, okay? Sure. I don't think I'm going to need five minutes, but I'll take it. Okay. Well, okay. thank you very much. The, the less time, the better, because we are, we are there's so, so much important information, but I, I think we just had to share this, okay? Absolutely. That's absolutely fine. Thank you very much. I am, uh, it's my you know, high honor to be back with AMPA and uh, provide at least our own perspective on you know, what's happening. But what I'm doing here is going to summarize. I'm going to summarize what this is about for this group. Uh, what you have spent your a couple of hours here this evening trying to do is uh, gather information that hopefully is reflective, you know, causes you to reflect on things you're doing. You cannot have the expertise to basically address the critical issues that have been discussed here. Can you see your slides? I can see my slides, yes. Okay. Um, you know, my, I've been in the business for over 30 years. I have, uh, I've, I've done some speaking. I'm a thought leader in this business. Done, I've got four books out there um, on, you know, I've got a best-selling book out there uh, and things like that. I run a physician's, you know, specialty practice, Wealth Rx for Doctors. Uh, you can go to wealthrxfordoctors.com forward slash AMPA. Uh, and uh, basically you would see get some more information on my background and things like that and the organization that we run. We run a family office, uh, which is an aggregation of expertise. The great thing about what we've done here this evening is really bring on experts. And this is something that I'd really want to emphasize and stress. You cannot afford to not surround yourself or yourselves with experts. You're not going to have the time, you don't have the resources or anything to determine the best solutions for you. What each of us as experts bring to you is essentially the ability to determine what your ailment may be, if I would use a medical metaphor. And then through the determination of your ailment, we're gonna recommend the course of treatment and help you fill the prescriptions that would make you well. As a firm, what we do is we help our clients protect what they have achieved. And by the way, the achievement is your practice or your medical uh, degrees and things like that, and then growing your wealth and minimizing your taxes. Those are the three imperatives that we have as a firm. Go on to the next slide, if you will. While those three things are the imperatives that we have for our clients, tonight, because this is more of an emergency, again, you know, a medical emergency that is creating a financial urgency, an emergency in and of itself, the focus for us is protection. When I ask the question usually, and you know, with a group of physicians through our specialty practice, what is your most important asset? Your most important asset is your capacity to earn. Your capacity to earn is what you must protect the most. They've talked about disability and things like that. One of the things that you must do is you must look at, review your disability policy because you guys are the ones in the firing line right now. And you wanna make sure that if any of you come down uh, with something that you're protected. 
Okay. My wife is a physician and we're staying in different rooms like right now uh, because essentially we're, we're exercising caution and abundance. Those are the kinds of things we're talking about. Protect yourself. The next thing is being calm and clearly reflective and poised about where you are. You want to take stock of where you are and you want to do it with a cool head. It's incredibly important that you have the poise to address the different things that you need to address. You can't have that if you don't surround yourself with the right team. That's the most important thing. And everybody that's here that's spoken today brings a unique set of expertise that would serve each and every one of you well. So I would encourage you to really pay attention to who you surround yourself with. The other thing about actionable steps for you is you have to develop an entrepreneurial mindset. One of the great things about the US economy is uh, they encourage entrepreneurship. Physicians, you have a compressed earning cycle, you've got a high capacity to earn, you've got all kinds of things and so on and so forth that you have to deal with. Uh, entrepreneurship comes in many different ways. You know, doctors, you need to look at how you can better serve your patients in other ways beyond just the practice of medicine. Develop an entrepreneurial mindset and that would also serve you well in this particular time. Go on to the next slide, if you will, please. You know, for private practitioners, uh, when I talked about entrepreneurship, this is you. Uh, today, for example, telemedicine is one of those things that has gone from disruption to becoming the new normal. Uh, reimbursements for medicine, you know, for, for your practice is now, you know, you're beginning to get better insurance reimbursements on things that you have, that have to do with telemedicine that wasn't the case before. The reality is telemedicine was disruptive but now we're trending towards it becoming the new normal. The other thing for you as business owners is paying attention. They've talked about cash flow and things like that. You have insurance accounts receivable that you need to be aggressive in collecting. We at my firm, we have a specialty group that deals with insurance accounts receivable. You can go to medexprime.com, WealthRx for doctors. That's where we can help physicians with collecting insurance related receivables. The final thing, coming back to poise, Dr. Ned Howell, Hallowell, you know, uh, he's a psychiatrist, by the way. Um, he has a book about anxiety and worrying and things like that. And one of the things he said is, look, never worry alone. My friends, these are very challenging times. Physicians are calling us and they're concerned about many different things. I will commend you for taking the initiative to have this kind of get together where people are sharing information. And I think the next thing we're gonna do here is share experiences and things like that. Key takeaway, my friends, pay attention to what the professionals are saying. You can't do the things that we're talking about. It's like, you know, specialists are specialists. And that's the reality. Every Every professional that's been on this call has some measure of specialization that will serve you very well. And there's no way that you can essentially accomplish any of these things on your own. Surround yourself with expertise. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, the next uh, presenter will be um, our very own Ampas psychiatrist. Give me a minute. Let me put him up. Justin, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. Here we go. Put your hands right here. Okay. Uh, okay. Take it away. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is um, Oka Justin Anyoku. I'm the medical director of Avance Interventional Psychiatry, where we specialize in telepsychiatry and uh, TMS, based in Australia, Georgia. Um, so this is a very trying time for all of us. As mentioned by other speakers, I'm not going to repeat what they mentioned. Can you go to the next slide, please? 
Um, now, studies have shown that depression and anxiety increases in times like this. Um, everybody is anxious, just like the other speaker said, never worry alone. However, what the, um, the everybody is saying is about the social distancing. And I would say it's really not social distancing that we should be preaching because in a next slide, please. We should be talking about physical distancing because when you keep yourself away from, when you isolate yourself from social activities, that is very detrimental to everybody, especially those that are depressed. Because it, when you are isolated, you are caught up in your own thoughts, and that is not a healthy thing. So I would emphasize this that we should really not be practicing social distancing we should be practicing physical distancing social distancing i would emphasize that you keep in touch with your friends and family over the phone video calls facebook and you know and, and stuff like this and if you do have friends who are depressed or family who you know have issues with depression or suicidal thoughts, this is a time to reach out to them and stay in touch with them. Call them, find out how they are doing. And um, also when you do that, you are also benefiting from reaching out to others. Now, very importantly, if you are feeling depressed or suicidal, you can call your um, Healthcare providers, if you're having suicidal thoughts, call 911. Now, you don't have to leave your house to have psychiatric consultation. Right now, the insurance companies are paying for, uh, they're reimbursing for phone, psych consultation, or even telepsychiatry, which is very common right now. So you can avail yourself of that opportunity to have consultation at your own home. Next slide, please. Now we all react to stress differently. Um, it could be changes in your eating pattern or your sleep. Um, people have difficulty concentrating, concentrating. There's worsening of chronic health problems. And because you are worried about all this, you might have increased use of alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs. Next slide, please. During this time, self-care is important. And how do you do that? You stay on routine um, of sleeping, waking at routine time, taking medications and eating at regular times. Netflix and chilling is fine without going overboard. Screen time and um, watching the news all the time should be compartmentalized and minimized as much as possible. Also, physical activities is very imperative for, for your mood. And this can include stepping into the backyard, going for a walk around a block when it's not crowded, going outside safely to get some vitamin D from sunlight and fresh air can also be very helpful. Next slide. Now for parents, uh, we have to be prepared when you are prepared and you are grounded, your, your kids don't become so anxious or have emotional problems. Now, what do you watch out for to make sure that your kids are, are fine? For younger kids, there could be excessive crying or irritation, uh, and that they could regress to what they had grown, excessive worrying or sadness, unhealthy eating or sleeping habits, irritability and acting out behaviors in things, poor school performance or avoiding school, difficulty with concentration and attention, avoidance of activities that they were enjoying in the past, unexplained headaches or body aches, use of alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs. Next slide. There are many things you can do to support your child and giving them facts and not um, the whole conspiracy theory that has been going on about the COVID can be helpful 
in a way that they can understand. We are showing your child or teen that they are safe and let them know that it is okay if they feel upset. Limit your family's exposure to news coverage of the event, including social media. Try to keep up with regular routines. If schools are closed, create a schedule for learning activities and, relaxing, and relaxation. Be a role model, take breaks, get plenty of sleep, exercise, and eat well. Connect with your friends and family members. Next slide. Now, some of us are responders, we work in the hospital or we are nurses. I mean, most of, all, almost all of us here are doctors. So um, you, there could be secondary traumatic stress, so we have to acknowledge this and learn the symptoms and how to deal with them, create a menu of personal self-care activities that you enjoy, such as spending time with friends and family, exercising or reading books. Ask for help if you feel overwhelmed or concerned that COVID-19 is affecting your ability to care for your family and patients as you did before the outbreak. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Um, uh, now we're gonna open it up to questions and answers for um, our, our um, presenters. So we are, we'll be open to questions for now. And does anybody have any questions? Um, or mute yourself and then um, uh, ask your question. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, just unmute yourself or should I unmute everybody? Hello, good evening. This is Dr. Madu, and I have two questions. My first question has to do with uh, co-pays and delinquency with payment of uh, deductibles and co-pays. And I was wondering if this will impact the CARES Act or if one should actually use um, a um, retrieval uh, system to um, uh, get this money back from the patients, like a collection agency. And my other question has to do with um, how to use the um, the CARES Act uh, loan. If if it happens that there is uh, no need to use the uh, loan for direct staff payments, but you still do need the loan for other aspects to grow the business and to employ other people. How will this apply? Um, can somebody take the first question about um, co-pays? Any, anybody, even if you're not a presenter, if you are, uh, we are at the a portion of the, uh, the uh, webinar where we are sharing experiences right now. If you, if you have expertise in this, you don't have to be able to answer the first question about co-pays. Um, I'll tell you what, uh, this is Anya Kanu. Um, if we can do this offline, I have, uh, through our Medex Prime organization, we can actually respond to that with the right people. So if, if that's something that is of interest, I can, I can have, you know, my people address that. Okay. Thank um, you. Uh, the person that asked the question, I hope you know how to contact Anya. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, you can. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I have a question. Is Dr. Chosan or are we? Are we going to have access to the slides? Yes. So this um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, we're going to put it on all the, all of the AMPA um, sites, um, social media. Um, um, so yes, it's being recorded. You have everything. The whole idea is to is to share share this uh, information. There's so much going on, and many of us don't know how to access this information because doctors routinely don't talk to each other about personal stuff like this. 
and myself, the I, I was going through, we all going through. Stuff. So I happened to be in Atlanta. I, I have a lot of friends here. That they were giving me inf information, so I, I thought it's a good idea for us to share all this and uh, have an open forum, and uh, hopefully we'll continue this. The second question was about the Care Act. Is anybody can anybody address the, the Care Act? Because we're gonna have a. Uh, uh, Godwin, um, we can put another webinar next week talking about the CARE Act and employment laws because the bills that the bill that we pass will have a lot of implications on our practice. Um, so I, I, we're going to hopefully bring some experts on that area as well. But if anybody want to want to mention about CARE Act, um, please share information. Ryan Stoll. Um, I, I think I heard a question about the, the loans in regards to the CARE Act and, and what can the loans be used for other business expenses other than employee related expenses. Uh, yes, they can, as it's stated right now in the, in the Act. Now they are actively negotiating what some of the uses of funds can be. Uh, but the CARE Act funds currently are eligible for employee-related salary and salary support expenses and, and benefits, insurance, things of that nature, as well as debt payments for the business, rent payments for the business, utilities. Um, th that's what is listed currently. Um, but the forgiveness portion of the CARE Act SBA loan is only related to loan funds utilized for salary type payments uh, to employees and, and, and salary support okay. currently. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Onike, I think you want to share something. I, I, is Dr. Hamonike still on, 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 on the, the line? Is there something you want to share with us? I'm still on the line. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I want to commend you and all the speakers for an excellent uh, overview, you know, obviously covering a broad spectrum of topics and, and concerns. Uh, I didn't particularly have anything to share. I'm just happy to listen, and I think uh, all the speakers have um, really covered most of the pertinence that, that have come to mind. Um, there's obviously a lot going on, and it's uh, rapidly changing, so there's going to be a need for continuous uh, input of, of information uh, to our individual practices. And, um, you know, right now, I don't know if some of you are aware, uh, some hospitals have contacted physicians um, asking them to consider taking pay cuts. Um, I know some of my orthopedic colleagues have, have had that in discussion, where in some cases they've been asked to take a 25 or, or 30 or even up to 50% pay cut for April and maybe going forward. Um, so that, there's a lot going on, and um, I don't really have any specific answers just yet. Just happy to listen. Thank you, everybody. Um, does anybody have anything else to share that's going on? Like, uh, I, I know some of us, like today, I had to f follow a lot of people in my office. Um, my county declared a state of emergency, and we had to close the office. Um, I, we have about 25 employees and I had to let most of them go on temporary follow until April 15. That's probably one of the most difficult things that uh, you can do as an employer is let let somebody go without any plan. It's very difficult. How are you guys dealing with that? Hi, Dr. Cora. I would like to hear how you're dealing with that because I wasn't sure what the, I'm in New York and they have certain laws about the staff and I'm not even sure of how, what kind of reimbursement you can give them if you follow them um, as, a, as an employer. Because in New York, if, you, if the state says that um, they have to stay at home, forces everybody to stay at home, they are entitled to take some form of leave um, and they calculate how much they could be paid per day if they work with you for a certain number of days. And although they say they're gonna reimburse you, most of the reimbursement might not come until May or June. And I don't know how, if your accountant say you don't need to pay them or if that doesn't apply in your state. So I think this is state by state. Um, I know in Georgia, uh, the 
state of Georgia Department of Labor, um, they put out their rule online. I, I, I'm actually going to share that an employment um, lawyer who was supposed to join on this call couldn't join. He's sending me some information to share on the e-group. But in Georgia, um, they're eligible for um, unemployment benefits. Okay? okay. Yeah. So, and it, at least in Georgia, the employer has to go online and file all the unemployment benefit because unemployment offices are closed. So everything is done online in Georgia. Um, in terms of the requirement... So the staff have to go and file unemployment benefits? The employer has to do it. That's the so thing. So the employer has to do it? Yes. Employer oh. has to, in Georgia. I don't know about your state. Okay. Now, federally, after um, effective April 2nd, uh, if you follow somebody because of COVID-19, you think you have to pay them for two weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to forward that information. The uh, employment attorney is going to forward that to me, the final rule. I'm going to share that on the e-group as well. Um, these, are, these, these things are changing. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So I think uh, it's, it's, it would be uh, appropriate for us to have another webinar specifically on that employment stuff next week. Um, mm -hmm. Stanley, let me, Stanley, if I might say something, this is a Mecca Chalano. Um, yeah, that, again, um, like Aham said, um, this it was a good, very good pre presentation. I commend you all for the work um, you guys did in getting this together. Um, I just wanted to talk about this um, employment thing. I mean, this the people you let go. From what I hear so far, I know it's not yet complete. And I know they're still working on the $2, $2 trillion dollar disbursement. I know it's not completed yet, but so so far what I'm hearing is that they are going to give money to employees to pay their staff. But then that will only be given to them to pay their staff if they don't let the staff go. So if you've let your staff go, I don't think you'll be eligible to get that money. That way both you and your staff will lose. So you have to bring them back. Okay. So if you bring them back, are you going to pay them for the period you let them go? So that's, that's the little thing about it. So which I think uh, maybe we might think about because um, if it's going to benefit both us and our employees and it's going to be released in a week or two, it might be better for them if we just keep them without letting them go. But, I, um, but what we're hearing is that these monies might not come out until May or June. The process is, you know, see now they've been debated even to sign the bill. Then the House has to sign it. Then the President has to sign it. Then we go to Treasury. And you go to the states and how this money is going to eventually get to you to the SBA. The SBA I spoke with in New York said they're not going to see this money till May earliest. That's what they are telling us. Just right. because of the mechanics of it, May, June, the mechanics of it. I don't know if anybody's heard the same thing. But also, what I was told in New York is that they're using secondary lenders. So currently, the SBA loan rate is 3.75%. Secondary lenders are lending at 6%. Ooh. And they're going to require the same requirements as the SBA. So if they come and they assess your practice, they do everything for you, they feel you're eligible, they will give you this money in a week. And then this same document you've given to them will be handed over to the SBA because it's already been sort of approved. And then when the SBA gets, their, gets the money, they, you give it back to these secondary lenders. But you'll be paying a 6% rate versus the 3.75% rate of the SBA if you don't want to wait. The SBA process is a little bit longer. So I don't know if anybody has heard of those secondary lenders. Ryan, can you comment on that? This is your area areas of specialty, is that correct, Ryan? You, you are muted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah. So what, what I believe she's talking about right now is the SBA disaster loan program. Um, in regards to the SBA disaster loan program, which is not part of the CARES Act, um, I have not heard what she is talking about. I am not currently packaging any deals, even for my own clients, for SBA disaster relief loans. The only, know, the only way that I know for, for my existing clients who are calling me on a daily basis to access the SBA disaster relief that's capped at 
uh, 3.75% rates and, and I think around $2 million loan amount is for them to apply through the secure SBA.gov website that the, the, the lady from Bank of America uh, referenced earlier uh, on, on, her, on her slideshow. Now, the CARES Act is going to go directly through secondary lenders, bank lenders, um, and it, it, although pricing guidelines have not been set on this, we are, it is my understanding that, that my management team and our National Lobbying Association, the National Association of Government Guaranteed Lenders, does not believe that these loans are going to be priced similar to a current SBA 7A loan, which is, which is the, the, the basic program that, that this is going to be funded through. It's my understanding that these loans through the CARES Act are going to be funded at below market rates, similar to disaster loans. But th that information is not final yet. And within the bill, with what I've read, I've seen no, um, no uh, concrete language in regards to pricing. But the expectation here is that it's going to be well below market pricing and that that six to seven and a half percent price range that that normal SBA loans are currently priced at, I think that's well above what you're going to see in the CARES Act, but we just we just don't know yet. And I think the next week or so it's going to be very telling for us as far as the timeline goes for the CARES Act. I think it's going to be at least two weeks before banks are ready to lend on this. This is this is a very different loan product than what we're what we're currently used to lending on um currently at cadence bank we're in the process of determining um how we're going to underwrite it because it's going to be substantially less underwriting than the average sba loan um and and uh how we are going to service this product as well as create a new product uh to to actually sell and and and, and lend on um but the Based on what I understand, this is going to be, for banks, substantially less lucrative than your average SBA deal um, and, and substantially lower pricing um, for, for the end borrower um, than, than your standard SBA deal as well. Thanks so much. Can you apply for both mm -hmm. the CARES and the disaster loan? Uh, I'm sorry, repeat that in regards to the CARES and the disaster loan? Am I, am I referring to both? Yeah, can you apply, no, can you apply to each? each um... Yes, you can, you can apply for both. Okay. Now, there's been a good bit of misinformation out there saying that you can't apply and be funded for both. That's not correct. What, what is accurate is you cannot apply for both and get double money for the same use of proceeds. So if we go back to my initial example of uh, of a hundred thousand dollar loan with seventy thousand dollars used for employee salaries and thirty thousand dollars used for other business expenses, what what my recommendation would be if if all these policies stick from from what I've discussed tonight would be to go the $30,000 route for immediate business expenses, non-salary employee, because those expenses are not forgivable in either debt program, in either loan program. Um, however, if, if you need employee payroll um, and you can wait uh, a few weeks, the better program due to the debt forgiveness um feature of the cares act you, you can you can borrow through both you, ju you just can't use the same the same the proceeds for the same thing so if you have equipment that needs to be paid off or or, or working capital type needs or some sort of business interruption type uh cost that's not salary related Currently, if I were making the decision for my own business, I would go to disaster relief for that immediately to try to get some funds in immediately and look for, look for the SBA CARES Act for employee-related um, expenses because I, what I read today is that that can be forgiven tax-free in the long term. 
Okay. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that. This is Anne. Yes, I just have, Go this ahead. is Dr. Madhu. I just have a, a couple of questions. My first question has to do with um, unemployment um, benefits to staff. My staff currently uh, have applied, have followed my staff or let them go with the understanding that they're going to be rehired and they are, they are all on unemployment uh, benefits at this time. And this is based on prior payroll deductions. It's only fair that they should benefit from all the payroll taxes I've paid over the years. And there's no way that I can see government holding us uh, to, to task for using a benefit that they've paid against. And, um, but if I rehire my staff, I can see I do not see why I should not benefit from the uh, CARE Act, even though my staff are now on unemployment. It's their benefit. My second point has to do with the $1,000 um, relief. Uh, I don't know how that factors in with um, all that we've been saying today. And then my third comment has to do with the um, um, payroll um, uh, tax relief for the future. Um, these are the three, uh, three or four issues that I would like addressed, please. Dr. Mamado, thank you for the question. Um, the, the, we don't have the, the employment lawyer who was supposed to have joined us here. Okay. The conflict right today. So I, I deeply apologize for that, but we, um, he, he will be available next week as soon as he gives me the date. I think there's a lot of unemployment questions. I have a lot of unemployment questions. Um, we are gonna have about two or three lawyers from different states to digest this next week. We will only talk about employment and unemployment issues because that's a big deal with all of this funding, how to deal with it. We, I, we, you know, unless it's anybody knows, please comment. No, I think you, this is Anya Kano. I think you want to leave this to the experts. That's what this is supposed to be about. That's what I would say. But I wanted to kind of make a comment about um, one of the physicians in the, in the call here talked about the, you know, hospitals and so on are asking physician employees to take pay cuts. Um, I don't know, since we don't know the whole, you know, everything about that, one of the things that we usually suggest to physicians in negotiating relationships with these institutions with employees is to basically kind of incorporate, you know, statutory employee, you know, W2 statutory employee, you know, kind of a, a contractual 1099 relationship in the packet. You don't have to be 100% employee. You can kind of eat, eat your cake and have it. The reason that it's beneficial to have some kind of an employment, um, you know, an independent contractor component uh, married or paired with the employee side of it is when you are, when you have your own business, there are so many benefits that are available to you that particularly from a tax planning standpoint, we really encourage our physicians to look at how to blend those two things from a compensation standpoint. That's something that we can, you know, there are experts that can help with that, attorneys and things like that. I just want to point that out because I know that a lot of times we see this when physicians come out, we just take on and become employees and don't realize that they can actually negotiate some of these things. And we encourage you guys to really pay attention to that. If this is happening, where they're asking you right now to take pay cuts, then this is an opportunity for you to do that and recharacterize your relationship. Um, um, can I say one thing to uh, Stanley? Um, just to clarify, maybe the last speaker can please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, again, to what Aham said, that they are telling them to take um, pay cut. My understanding, again, the last speaker can correct me, is that part of the money that is going to be released in this $2 trillion is some give away to some hospitals to cover all these expenses they're going through right now. So if they're going to give them some money to cover through, then why should they tell us to take pay cut again? So again, I think this is something you can discuss with them when they're telling you to take a pay cut. That fine. If you take a pay cut now and they give them this money later, are they going to reimburse you for this pay cut you're taking now? Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, uh, that's a good point. Uh, I, I can't speak for any institution. There's no question that you're going to have some bad actors institution-wise who are going to take proactive steps uh, to do things that may not be particularly conducive. What I would say is the opportunity you have is to recharacterize your relationship. So you can still maintain the integrity of your compensation, but when you change it, you're able to take advantage of the tax laws to a better extent by that recharacterization. Okay, I think- uh, Stanley, yeah. Stanley, can I just, yeah. if you're making a list, this is uh, Mecca on you. If you're making a list of questions for the employment lawyers, can you put on it to unravel for us the difference between furlough and terminate in terms of unemployment benefits, um, qualifications for the CARES package, et cetera, et cetera. Because I think that there are some differences that are not very clear that would help us in terms yes, of- and also, um, sorry, sorry, and also paid sick leave uh, for this COVID. You have another term, paid emergency sick leave to care yes. for somebody that's sick or when your child's school is closed from the COVID. There's so many caveats to it. Right, yeah. but I mean, I guess I'm asking because there are, there are some companies that have laid people off so they could be eligible for unemployment. I don't know if that's a state thing, mm -hmm. or whether if they're furloughed, they're still eligible or not, et cetera, et cetera. But just, I know it's not today, but if you could put that on your list. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm making a list. And if you have any um, bunny question, um, you can email me at my email, drpokoro at georgiaplastic.com. I will forward it to the employment lawyers that will come on next week. Um, the, um, the date and time is not set, but I, I'm going to put out that information. This is information we all need to know. Um, you can also uh, comment, um, just send me an email with the questions that you, you want to ask. But I think when we, have, when we have an open forum next week, we'll be able to, next week we'll be just dissecting all of this employment equation, just so much of it. But, um, he, uh, by that time, the, the bill that's in Congress and Senate should have been resolved. Hopefully we know exactly what's in it. Um, okay, so that, uh, Stanley, if it's okay, I'll just make a very quick comment, follow up to um, what I'd alluded to earlier. It, it, it's not me directly, but um, in conversation and other forums I'm involved in, it's something that's happening. And I agree with, um, I think it's Enyi that mentioned, uh, it being an opportunity to uh, renegotiate. So in some cases, they're hospital employees, and some people, it's, it's a big group. Um, but what the guys are doing now is saying, let me look at the books. Uh, let me see why it's necessary to make this sacrifice right now, and then um, see what other advantages can be gained from that, whether it's a, a change in a, um, in a um, non-compete clauses or something else that they may not be happy with. So the dust really hasn't settled. It's still probably premature to draw conclusions just yet, but it's, it's something that's happening out there um, and it's affecting some of our colleagues. Yeah, I have to agree with that, uh, Dr. Hans. I think that's spot on. I think the dust hasn't settled. Um, as I, this is, this is Owe Bellet, the, um, the attorney. I would just like to say that for, for the members that are in Florida that have uh, labor and employment questions and, have, and, and those issues are urgent, um, Dr. Okoro has my information. I have a colleague that will make himself available for the remainder of the week and um, will gladly answer those pressing questions you ask. Um, as I stated earlier in my, um, in my presentation, this, it doesn't directly speak to the employment question, but it does speak to contracts that you currently have with, with, either with, with, with suppliers or with service providers and with uh, important employees. This is definitely going to be a time to sort of uh, review those contracts and review the force majeure provisions of those contracts because that will determine whether or not um, important provisions or material provisions of those contracts can be amended um, to accommodate the unique circumstance we find ourselves in. So, are we, um, if I hear you correctly, um, you're going to make your partner available to us next week, correct? Well, well, next week and for the remainder of this week as well, if there's an urgent question. Yes, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate that.
Um, I think uh, any other questions before we conclude? We had 100 people log in to this conference. I didn't, I reserved 100 lines and uh, I guess I, I underestimated. I'm sorry for some people that couldn't log on uh, initially because the, the, the lines were full at 100, which is crazy. Um, we're going to be having another one soon. I don't have the debit to be next week. Uh, does anybody else have any burning questions before we end? What is there any plans uh, to postpone the AMPA meeting this year? Have we discussed that yet? Um, as a member of ESCO, all I can tell you right now is the entire ESCO, uh, myself, uh, Dr. Shamene um, the our president-elect and Dr. Uh, um, uh, uh, the past president, who, who that's who are the, in the um, ESCO, we, we have been de deliberating this. We are talking about it. It's in our mind. We know we are just we, like you. Uh, I think we will be having a decision very soon. So have patience. Our meeting is not until towards the middle and end of June. This is a very important year for us because it's an election year. So we are looking at all of that stuff. And the... AMPA membership have given us the trust to make the right decisions. So just trust us. We are just like you. We are looking at all our, all our available means. Um, we, are, we are two months away. We make the right decision for AMPA. Too. There's a lot of back and forth going on. We're talking about it, but everything that we're talking about is for the sole benefit of AMPA and its members. And uh, we will make the right decision. So just hang tight. I know people are itching, but we're still in March. So in April, before April, um, middle of April, I'm sure we will be, we will come up with the right, the right the decision. We we don't, we didn't want to make a knee-jerk reaction because everybody else was doing it. Guys, we're Nigerians, we can sustain a little bit. Just hang tight. We will come up with the right decision. And Becca, does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Okoro. Yes. Real quickly, this is Dan from MD Capital. I sent you something by email or by text. It's in reference to the physicians in the state of Florida. Okay, okay, yes, yes, yes. It answers some questions around reemployment assistance and the frequently asked questions. If you can put that up on your, yeah, I'll on your put site. Now. Thank you. Give me one minute. Um, So this is from the state of Florida, correct? Right there? Okay. Yes, so every state, state specific, this is for Florida, the physicians. So I think it's uh, pretty straightforward. You can see, and if you can pass that on to all the participants on the call, it should be able to help them answer questions as regards to uh, layoffs and, and furloughs, especially this is specific to the state of Florida. Okay. All right, so. Yeah, I will. Well, if you want to reach our legal team, which is away at Belly Law, or you can reach out to MD Capital directly, uh, we're here to support you. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel. I will send that uh, in there. Um, I know our IT person is online. I will be forwarded to him to share in the social me media. Tabo, any comment? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. So excellent job, man. It's a really uh, exciting forum, man. You guys did a good job. So yes, uh, we will be sharing this on the wherever I want to put it, the website or Facebook, whatever it is, but uh, and the e-group. Um, so thanks for the holding this forum. Thank you. Well, guys, it's um, 10, almost 10.30 on the East Coast. We've been on for two or two and a half hours, a lot of inf inf information. Um, I think uh, it was well re received by our membership. So we're going to bring it. The next forum will be all legal, mostly lawyers, and um, from, from Florida to Georgia to California and New York, hopefully. And that should really cover the country. And um, that should be good. If there's no other comments, I would like to end. Any, any last minute comments? Is, is our president online, Dr. Emily Fayette? 
Okay. Uh, um, Chris, our present elect. Chris, are you still online? Yes. Um, thanks, Stanley, for this uh, coordination. And I also want to thank members for actually responding. Uh, it's, it's quite exciting to see the response from members, over 100 people. And um, the information was well received. And I want to give another big hand of applause to all our presenters. Um, I appreciate you know, all the things that they have done. And I know as members, we are also very glad to have them on board. So thank you very much, everybody. And the last, thank you very much, Chris. Um, I think uh, yeah, AMPA brings a lot of value to, to all of us. So, so um, if, uh, if you're wavering, if you're going to join AMPA, there's a lot happening in AMPA. So uh, visit AMPA.org. There's a lot of information, a lot of things that we're doing. Join us, um, to, you know, join the conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, good night, everyone. All right, good night. Good night.